Hello, this is Michael Tracy, and this video is going to analyze the 1996 Everest disaster in response to the recent spat of videos about it. While this is a departure from my Mallory and Irvin content, the large number of inaccurate and even misogynistic videos simply became too much for me to tolerate. This video assumes you are familiar with the 96 Everest disaster and know who the participants on the south side were. Rob Hall, Scott Fisher, John Krakauer, Anatoly Bukrev, Sandy Pittman, uh, Lena Galmogard, Yatsku Damba will be the primary ones discussed in this video. This will be another three-part video series, but unlike my last three-part series, all the fireworks will be in this first video. This first video will delve into the Sandy Pittman issue because she has been singled out for criticism in the recent YouTube videos. I'm also using Sandy Pittman's story because it discusses what the big secret of the 96 disaster was. So the big secret was reported in Lena Gamelgaard's book, Climbing High, on page 162. She is describing the conversation with Lopsung, the lead climbing Sherpa for Mountain Madness, as they take a break on May 10th. Lopsung is easily recognized in his white Sherpa suit, which he wears over his down clothes, and he has a flagpole sticking out of his backpack. Between coughing fits, he manages to tell us that he and Scott have arranged for a stunt on the summit of Everest, but he will not reveal any of the details. And on the actual summit, she explains this is the reason for the extended delay of Lopsung. Lopsung is unpacking his flag arrangement and waiting for Scott so they can play their boyish pranks. So if you have read Into Thin Air and wondering why didn't they just head down, why did they wait so long? Now you know. There was this boyish stunt planned for the summit with the Mountain Madness team. Exactly what the stunt was remains a mystery, as Scott Fisher died on the mountain and Lopsang was killed in an avalanche later that same year. Obviously, if John Krakauer had written those exact same words in his Outside Magazine article or in his best-selling book, that is all we would have heard about for the last 28 years. Boyish prank kills eight on Everest. The entire story would have been about the prank and the entire blame put on Scott Fisher. This does not mean that any of that analysis would have been accurate, just that simple stories where people are punished for their obvious hubris sell very well. The only thing required to stop that is for all the expedition members who are in the spotlight, they need to keep their mouth shut. And Pittman did. Her reasons for this remain a mystery. But it appears she had a great deal of respect for Scott Fisher and wished for him to be remembered by the mountains he climbed and the people he touched, rather than being the bête noir for all things wrong with Everest. But every story needs a villain, and Sandy was an easy target. I did not know Scott Fisher, but there must have been something special in him to command this type of loyalty and respect. This video will look at the woman who lost the most for keeping that secret, and will look at whether she is really the unqualified amateur who had no business being on the mountain. Looking at the climb on May 10th, there are two primary sources. John Krakauer's Into Thin Air, and Anatoly Bukrev's The Climb. Despite all the manufactured controversy around these two books, they mostly agree on the key factual elements of what occurred on May 10th and 11th. Most of the controversy in those books is about the opinions of the authors and about who is to blame and what should have been done differently. Unfortunately, Bukrev was killed in an avalanche in 1997, and Krakauer has long since moved on from Everest. I'm not going to spend much time looking at their analyses because both of those authors chose to leave out extremely key details. In addition to leaving out the stunt, Krakauer also leaves out any discussion of the amounts of oxygen used by the two teams. Scott Fisher provisioned each member of the Mountain Madness team with four bottles of oxygen for the summit climb, while Rob Hall's Adventure Consultant members only received three bottles for the summit push. In the end, four of the five deaths on the south side were Adventure Consultant personnel, while Scott Fisher was the only death on the Mountain Madness team, nor were there any serious injuries on the Mountain Madness team. As a note, of the eight total people who died that day, three were Indian climbers on the north side, and I will not be discussing them as part of this analysis. I will address the issue of why I believe Gamelgard's account that some stunt was planned by Fisher. With any high altitude account, there is a significant risk that the person is mistaken. However, Fisher and Lopsang planning to pull some stunt on the summit explains a lot of the problems with the timelines. Things that were previously explained as being stupid for no reason now have those same people being stupid for a reason. It could also explain why some of the versions didn't match up and why Scott Fisher was so slow. It's not clear exactly what the stunt entailed, but if it required some equipment or banners or something to be carried to the summit, it could explain Fisher's extremely slow climb time. 
It is also difficult to believe that Krakauer didn't know that Fisher was planning some stunt. He wouldn't know exactly what it was, but he most likely would have known that some sort of stunt was planned. First, anyone who spends any amount of time looking into this will immediately spot there are problems with the timing and the, oh, they were just stupid explanation doesn't really work. Gamelgard was interviewed for various documentaries, and the entire account is published in her book. This leaves it as either Krakauer missed the fact that Fisher and Lopsang were planning a major stunt on the summit, making his book the worst piece of investigative journalism in mountain entering history, or he knew about it and chose to ignore it, making it neither investigative nor journalism. Despite the numerous problems with Krakauer's account, for this video, I will almost exclusively use Into Thin Air for the key points of the climb. For all of these points, there is little to no difference with the accounts when it comes to reporting on people other than Krakauer himself. When Krakauer is writing about his own climbing, how fast he is going, how well he is climbing, other accounts provide a very different view than his. I will only mention a couple of these in passing, and we'll cover those areas in more detail in the third video. The failure to analyze the difference between the amount of oxygen used between adventure consultants and mountain madness is the largest problem with Krakauer's analysis. And again, it is difficult to believe that he just didn't know about this. The difference is specifically mentioned in Gamelgard's book, so we are again left wondering why Krakauer knew none of this. Krakauer climbed with adventure consultants, which he reports as providing a total of three oxygen bottles for the summit. It appears he believed everyone was supplied with three bottles, but the Mountain Madness teams were indeed supplied with four bottles. And this gets into the Yellow Brick Road. Now, the origin of yellow, the Yellow Brick Road is from Fisher, and this is Krakauer's account of him speaking with Fisher. On this occasion, he buttonholed me in to talk about the guided Everest expedition he was planning. I should come along, he cajoled, and write an article about the climb for outside. When I replied that it would be crazy for someone with my limited high-altitude experience to attempt Everest, he said, Hey, experience is overrated. It's not the altitude that's important. It's your attitude, bro. You'll do fine. You've done some pretty sick climbs, stuff that's way harder than Everest. We've got the big E figured out. We've got it totally wired. These days, I'm telling you, we built the yellow brick road to the summit. It is not clear if the hard-hitting investigative journalist asked Fisher to explain exactly what his guiding company offered that others did not. But if he did, Krakauer never reported it. And in fact, Krakauer seemed unaware that Fisher's clients received more bottles than Rob Hall's. However, Gamelgard had no trouble understanding exactly how the yellow brick road was built. It was not actually built with yellow bricks. Instead, it was built with orange Kevlar of the Russian oxygen bottles. This is her commenting on the oxygen situation at the Mountain Madness first cache location. Thanks to the efforts of our high-altitude Sherpas, there's a supply of full oxygen bottles here and supposedly a supply below the South Summit. One more advantage of being a member of such an expensive expedition. Gamelgard states they had started from South Coal carrying two bottles. They picked up one roughly at the balcony and an additional one at the South Summit. As they were carrying two bottles, the one on the South Summit would be used on the descent using this oxygen bottle caching scheme. I'll describe that mechanism in more detail in the third video, but Scott Fisher's Yellow Brick Road was not some made-up fantasy. It was a well-developed system that he designed that would allow him to put anyone on the summit simply by increasing the number of cash points. Using additional cash points, you could use 20 bottles to get to the summit, as long as you were willing to pay for it. In 1996, he used two cash points as opposed to Rob Hall's one cash point, giving Fisher's team significantly more oxygen. As a result, all of Fisher's team that set out that day reached the summit and returned without serious injuries, with Fisher himself being the only exception. In contrast, Rob's Hall team had numerous members turn around, and four of the five deaths on the south side were Rob Hall and the other Adventure Consultants team members. I do not wish to downplay the heroic efforts of Anatoly Bukrev. However, the primary reason the climbers were stranded in the dog pile was because of the storm. Had there been no storm, there would have been no need to rescue any of the Mountain Madness clients. On the Adventure Consultants team, both Yasko Namba and Doug Hansen were in distress. And while Yasko could possibly have made it back if the storm had not come, Doug Hansen was a different matter. So now to Sandy Pittman. The interwebs have told you that she was an inexperienced climber who had no business on Everest. However, 1996 was her third trip to Everest. 
Her first was in 1993, where she reached 23,500 feet on the south side. For those familiar with the Mallory and Irvin videos, the North Coal is at approximately 23,000 feet. Thus, on her first attempt on Everest, she got about as far as Tenzing Norgay did on his third climb in 1938. Tenzing's first attempts being on the north side, and it was not until his seventh and final climb up Everest that he was able to reach the summit in 1953. Tenzing's climbing partner was Edmund Hillary, who himself had only reached approximately 20,000 feet on his first climb on Everest. Hillary only managed 21,500 on his second visit to Everest, which was really more of a half-hearted attempt on Changsi, Changsi being the north peak of Everest. Of course, Hillary reached the summit on his third visit to Everest, and neither of the first two climbs involved actual attempts on the summit. Back to Pittman, her next, she next climbed Everest in 1994 as part of Dave Brashear's expedition of the Kangsheng Face. The Kangsheng Face is the most difficult and least climbed face on Everest. It is incredibly steep, extremely risky, uh, high avalanche risk. Uh, her high point in that particular expedition was not recorded, but the fact that Dave Brashears gave her a position on the expedition means she certainly has some degree of competency, at least enough for Dave Brashears who has recently passed away. Next was her 1996 climb, for which I will compare her climb times to John Krakauer's. 1996 was Krakauer's first and only trip to any 8,000 meter peak, and his climb and descent times are almost identical with those of Pittman. Krakauer summited at 1.12 p.m. for a total of 13 hours and 37 minutes of climbing, and Pittman summited at 2.15 p.m. for a total of 14 hours and 10 minutes, with a difference of just 33 minutes in total climb time. On the summit, Krakauer did pick up summit rocks, just as Mallory and Irvin would have done in 1924. Krakauer goes on to describe how the crowds and the delays uh, that uh, slowed him down, but the Himalayan database only reports that 20 western climbers climbed the southeast ridge on May 10th, with only 16 going above the south summit, where bottlenecks can become a problem. So I'm not sure which crowds Krakauer is talking about. In terms of the climb times, for comparison, a 47-year-old Dave Hahn climbed the Southeast Ridge route in just seven hours in 2009, which is pretty darn good at any age. And a much younger Jake Norton at 35 was also climbing with Hahn that year, making it in seven hours and 50 minutes. All this despite the Himalayan database reporting 53 Western climbers the same day as Hahn and Norton. Here I use the term Westerner to mean non-Sherpa, as Sherpa simply means people from the East. So while Krakauer provides numerous excuses as to why it took him over 13 hours to reach the summit, such as him waiting on other people, being behind others, etc., anyone climbing the mountain that day would have had the exact same issues. And as noted as above, the 16 Westerners above the south summit could hardly be considered a crowd. Krakauer explains that Lobsang was supposed to fix the ropes, but he was allegedly too tired from short roping Sandy Pittman. However, Lobsang departed with his own clients on the Mountain Madness group, which left 30 minutes after the Adventure Consultants group. It is not clear how Lobsang was supposed to fix the ropes if he left 30 minutes after the Adventure Consultants group. Lobsang was also climbing without oxygen, which may provide a good reason why he might have been tired. Much has been made of this short roping of Sandy Pittman, but this is simply people reading what they want and ignoring any contrary statements. To John Krakauer's credit, he does present Pittman's side in his book. For her part, Pittman didn't ask to be short-roped. As she left Camp 4 at the front of Fisher's group, Lobsang abruptly pulled her aside and girth-hitched a bite of rope to the front of her climbing harness. Then, without consulting her, he clipped the other end to his own harness and began to pull. Lobsang would later say that this was a mistake, and he actually thought he was short-roping Lena Gamelgard, but then Lopson again changes that position and says it was not. He did not think it was Lena Gamelgard. But it's not even clear why Lena Gamelgard would need to be short roped either. In any case, Krakauer's account is that the short roping arrangement went phenomenally well, with the pair, quote, passing other people and making good time. However, Krakauer had just said that Pittman started at the front of her group. This would mean that the short roping went so well they were passing people who left 30 minutes in front of them. These would be climbers from Adventure Consultants, none of whom ever reported being passed by little Sandy Pittman. The next time Krakauer would see Pittman was on the Hillary Step, where he notes, I fuzzily remembered Sandy Pittman climbing past as I waited, bound for the summit, followed an indeterminate time by Charlotte Fox and then Lopsang Jongbu. 
Yasku materialized next, just below my precarious stance, but was fluxum by the last and steepest portion of the step. I watched helplessly for 15 minutes as she struggled to haul herself up the uppermost brow of rock, too exhausted to finally manage it. Finally, Tim Madison, who was waiting impatiently directly below her, put his hands beneath her buttocks and pushed her to the top. Thus, Krakauer personally witnessed Pittman climb the only technical part of the route with no apparent difficulty, and she was certainly not being short-roped by Lobsang at that time. Instead, it was Yasko who had the problem. Pittman then reaches the summit at 2.15 p.m. The issue is that Pittman and the rest of the team then spent a significant amount of time on the summit, not leaving until 3.10. This is written off as some type of exuberance or inexperienced climbers not keeping track of the time on the summit, but if your Yeti senses are tingling with those explanations, then congratulations, you found the great mystery of 1996. Why they waited on the summit was explained by Lena Gamelgaard in her Danish book, the Danish Wikipedia notes it was published in 1996, and my English version of the book states the Danish version was copyright 1996, but does not explicitly state when it was first published in Danish, though likely 96. In any case, in 1999, her book was published in English, and hidden in the two brief passages is a secret everyone was keeping. They were waiting on the summit for Scott to pull some type of stunt. Now, getting back to crack hour. On the descent, he runs out of oxygen and gets into trouble below the Hillary step. He is unable to descend until a guide, Mike Groom, comes down and gives him some more oxygen. In his book, Krakauer sort of passes this off as no big thing. Just then, Mike Groom caught up to me on his way down from the summit. Mike had climbed Everest back in 1993 without gas, and he wasn't overly concerned about going without. He gave me his oxygen bottle, and we quickly scrambled over to the south summit. So let's look at this. On page 209... Groom is with Yasko on the summit. On page 196 is Groom with Yasko on the south summit descending. And on page 213, it is again Groom guiding Yasko down the balcony. Groom only sends Yasko down in front of him when he finds Beck Weathers and tries to help Beck. From this, it would appear that Mike Groom, a guide for adventure consultants, was guiding down Yasko, an adventure consultant's client, who was having trouble. In fact, the only time Krakauer does not mention that Yasko is with Groom on the descent of the upper mountain is when Krakauer needs to take Groom's oxygen bottle. For this, he simply describes that Mike Groom caught up to me on his way down from the summit. Okay, so where's Yasko? Curiously, in a speaking engagement, which is available online, Krakauer completely leaves out his receiving an extra bottle from Mike Groom. Exactly what happened to that bottle remains unclear. However, as Krakauer cannot report his own oxygen use accurately, I highly suspect that his reports of the oxygen consumption of other clients might also be inaccurate. One more problem is Krakauer's pontification that guides should not climb on Everest without oxygen, quoting Krakauer. Make no mistake, there is a strong consensus among the most respected high-altitude guides, as well as the preeminent experts in the esoteric field of high-altitude medicine set class physiology, that is exceedingly risky for a guide to lead clients on Everest without using bottled oxygen. But the fine print to Krakauer's rule is that if a guide is already assisting a distressed client down the mountain, at that point it's fine to climb without oxygen as long as you give your oxygen to John Krakauer. Unfortunately, the distressed client Mike Groom was guiding down at that point was Yasko Namba, who ended up dying. So perhaps Krakauer was right. If Groom had not given up his oxygen, perhaps he could have guided her down faster, and perhaps she would still be alive. But then one is left wondering what would have happened to Krakauer himself, being un unable to descend and stuck so high up. In any case, with the extra boost from Groom's oxygen, and picking up his own new bottle on the south summit, Krakauer reaches the balcony at 4.45 p.m. and the top of South Cole at 6.30. Now, looking at Pittman on the descent, she is in Beidelman's group, and they arrive at the top of South Cole at 7.30 p.m. At this point, the storm is in full force, and although they are only 200 vertical feet above the South Cole camp, it will take them five hours to make that last 200 feet. But to compare to Krakauer, he was at that same spot at the top of South Cole at 6.30 Comparing descent rates, Krakauer left the summit at 1.30 p.m. and arrived top of South Coal five hours later. Pittman left the summit at 3.10 p.m. and arrived at the exact same spot in only four hours and 20 minutes, and even had time to stop and get an injection of dexamethasone on the way down. There are very different versions about how Pittman managed to achieve such a rapid descent, but it appears that she simply slid down on her butt, a perfectly acceptable technique. Bukrev himself even did it. 
But the same as the on the ascent, Krakauer again blames others for his slow descent. Curiously, the 30 minutes that was reported as the delay waiting at the Hillary step on his descent in the Himalayan database magically morphs into more than an hour in his book. Of course, the astute viewer has noticed that Pittman and the rest of the group were only one hour behind Krakauer on their final descent when the storm stopped them in their tracks. Thus, had they simply left the summit earlier, they might have been able to all straggle into camp at about the same time as Krakauer. And to be sure, Krakauer does not describe his arrival in camp as some triumphant return. He is barely able to pull himself halfway into his tent, and then he collapses. Somehow he manages to get his boots and crampons off and passes off in the sleeping bag for the next eight to ten hours, sleeping through the storm of the century that he would later become famous for reporting on. Ultimately, of the eight people who died, three were on the north side, and clearly the storm was the primary reason for the deaths. For all these people, the storm plays a major factor. On the south side, Doug Hansen reached the summit hours past any reasonable turnaround time, and none of this was caused by waiting behind Sandy Pittman. Rob Hall made the decision to try to save his client, and that ended up costing him his life. For Andy Harris, Krakauer has already stated he feels terrible about it. I will cover exactly what happened with Harris in the third video because it is very important as sort of a lessons learned. Krakauer writes, Given what unfolded over the hours that followed, the ease with which I abdicated responsibility, my utter failure to consider that Andy might have been in serious trouble was a lapse that's likely to haunt me for the rest of my life. And that is not Krakauer merely expressing some type of self-denigrating regret. His assessment is sincere and accurate. So this leaves Yasko Namba, who was an adventure on the Adventure Consultants team, to start with. As an adventure consultant's client, she had one less bottle than the Mountain Madness clients. In addition, both Rob Hall and Andy Harris, the guides for adventure consultants, were rescuing Doug Hansen. This leaves just Mike Groom, who was assisting Yasko down the mountain, but there was only so much he could do, and it is not clear exactly how much oxygen Groom had given up. I'll get into more of that analysis in the third video, but suffice it to say that had Doug Hansen turned around, Rob Hall would have been descending, Andy Harris would have been descending, and either one could have assisted Yasko and perhaps even Scott Fisher. But Doug Hansen was a postal worker and an experienced climber with prior experience on Everest, and that doesn't fit the narrative. Instead, it's all Sandy Pittman's fault.